Kim, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and give your meta commentary of the uh, session so that we have some time at the end for the audience participation. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move out of the spotlight. They turn a whole light to the left. That one's right on me. So I'm going to go over here. So <laughs> you want to my chair? No, no, I'll stand because that light's going to follow me no matter where I go. <laughs> 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 that is my guess. Well, that, that was just a fantastic panel. So thanks. Give them a clap.
table today and what they could bring to the table to inform the agenda for research in science education. So I think there's, there's a lot there. The, my next point that I had here uh, that came from pre-meetings really rather than the presentation today was, was large for me today. It had to do with emotions and knowing. We need to find a way to connect emotions back with what we know. It is a part of what we know, and yet it's been sanitized. What we know has been separated away from our interests and our emotions, and that, that feeling of disgust that you can get with, with things that are just morally wrong. They shouldn't be happening. The ethics are not good. We need to carry that forward with our knowledge and with our educational programs. And uh, so that's, it, it's kind of apropos of this report that got released yesterday. The, the Intergovernment, <coughs> Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its fifth assessment report yesterday. It got leaked a little bit earlier, so the reports came out in the press. Chapter 11 is well worth reading. It, it's a chapter that deals with human health. Take a look at it. Science educators, take a look at it. It was authored by about 30 scholars, cross-disciplinary, from 15 different countries. And according to one press report, uh, among other things, what they predict is the extinction of humanity within the next 90 years. The extinction of humanity? Now, maybe they're wrong. Maybe they're exaggerating. But it's something that science educators probably need to pay attention to. It's, 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 it sounded fairly important. Uh, they predicted other extinctions as well. Of course, it didn't involve humans, and so there was some comfort there, right? So mass extinctions were being predicted. They talked about the major problem of climate change as far as human health is concerned had to do with diet, the air we breathe, uh, just about anything you can imagine associated with the Earth is going to get worse. And so they talk a lot about the trauma of dealing with this. And the thing that really struck me was that they talk about the classless way that this is going to impact the world. The poorest people in the world are going to be impacted first. By groups within countries that are affluent, like the United States, and by nation elsewhere in the world. But that's something that science education needs to pay attention to. We can't have a class of citizens, can we? I mean, isn't it something that we really need to pay attention to? Not just in the United States as we try to be number one in the world. Isn't it something we need to address globally? Don't we need coalitions of science educators that take a world look at something like climate change? Heaven forbid being from Australia and having a, a prime minister that declared it to be bad science. Uh, so we need to do something about that. Uh, the Prime Minister of Australia is a product of our science education. So is Ronald Reagan, and so is Shirley Steinberg. So all of those people did science education, and we need to pay attention to that. Some other things, I think literate citizenry looms as a goal that we need to take seriously. We need to get out of the box of looking at education as only occurring in schools. Science education needs to embrace the pre-birth through death spectrum. We need to go across institutions. The media, we've heard about the media. We, we must do research on the media. We must do research in a whole lot of institutions, including the home, the criminal justice system, etc., etc. And so science educators, I think, when they frame the questions, can break out of the boxes that we find ourselves in. Broadening the scope of what constitutes science education. I think there's a call for this, uh, certainly for those of us that say that activism is important. We need to think of science as beyond learning theories and learning stuff that you can talk about. It seems to me that science must embrace what you do and, and how you act in the world, and that brings back the question of emotion. And so, looking at science in terms of some kind of dialectic between uh, what you know and can talk about and what you know and can do, and in fact, 
fact, what you do do and what you decide not to do, which is all an important part of, of that hierarchy of values that goes with our learning. So I think we have to think broadly. We have to sort of uh, think activism. And then the final point that I would make, uh, because I'm getting a wrap up here, um, has to do with how we think about what we do in terms of interest. We heard about interest in some of our presentations today. And if, if you think about uh, pursuing depth and breadth and doing this 7 by 24 instead of just in certain little boxes, think of all the resources we have for learning and yet we, we focus on this curriculum that takes priority, the assessments that go with it, and yet there's this bigger world out there. How do you learn your science these days? Don't you Google it? Don't you go out on Google and, and you go to the CNN website and the BBC website and, and various websites and you get your science and you get your depth 